Welcome, welcome to the kickoff of the Masters Week of the TU Delft, Delft University of Technology. My name is Hanno van Keulen. I'm in the middle of the old town of Delft, looking out over the outer Delft. And um, I have Martijn in front of me and Eliane, who will help me to uh, work you through this eventful uh, meeting because it is life changing. Choosing your masters is a big obligation you now face. What will it be? There are 45 programs in Delft you can choose from. All beautiful programs. Some bigger than others. I would advise you to go for my program because in my daily life I'm program director of science education and communication. The Lerarenopleiding, as we say in Dutch. It's the only program which is not in the English language. So maybe when you're fluent in Dutch and you want that, you're welcome. But then I have 44 colleagues who also want you. And uh, in this uh, Kick off, uh, we will show you what you can do in Delft, what kind of programs there are, why is it so important that you are here with us. And uh, therefore I have guests, four guests. I will chat a little bit. They have made their decisions. Uh, two of them are already PhD students. They finished their masters. One is a, a, a teaching assistant and an, an innovator. Uh, and one is a student, a real student like you. And we will talk um, together about their, their choices, and what you need to become successful in these programs. And we will do that um, uh, through the four uh, themes of Delft University of Technology. Probably you know them already. Think of four themes that are important to society and that you uh, think and uh, will uh, define our programs. Do you know which uh, programs they are? Probably not because I asked around to several people and uh, many were not aware that we value uh, digital society. That's one. We value healthcare. Health and care, I would say. Uh, we value climate and energy. And we have resilient cities and mobility as one of the themes. So this basically uh, makes it easier for you. Choosing from 45 programs can be a core, but actually you will have to uh, find value in four themes. And maybe each of these 45 programs contributes to climate and energy or to resilient cities. It's up to you to find your way. This kickoff meeting will start it off and uh, next week, uh, this week, uh, tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, you will have a chance to visit all these programs. And for international students and, and others, there is on Friday is an uh, admission event. So um, we have uh, some questions for you to reflect on. And uh, for that, we use uh, uh, Menti, Mentimeter. And, and I think I would suggest that you use your, your, your mobile phone, your cell phone uh, to, uh, to follow that so that you can easily follow this kickoff event too. And there is a question, I think it will pop up behind me. How would you like to contribute to society with technology? Because probably you're in it for the credit points and you want to make a living out of uh, your studies, but we want you to contribute to society through technology. What is important to you? Well, and um, somehow uh, answers will uh, pop up and uh, when uh, we have uh, something coming in, I will uh, uh, give it back and, and, and I think probably it is already time for me to. To uh, go to the website, yes. Uh, um, you uh, I get some some feedback from Martijn. Um, uh, I have to mention www.menti.com. That's the one. And uh, we'll repeat it again because I have it on my thing. It's tudelft.nl slash kickoff. That's where you have to be. And there it is. And yes, uh, some of you are already wanting to change the world for tomorrow. Hydrogen. That will have something to do with climate and energy, I guess. Sustainability. 
meaningful innovation. It's just not innovation as such, but meaningful. And what is meaningful? What do we need in society? Important things, but also uh, rockets, of course. It's uh, uh, it's it's space. It is uh, aero. Well, my job is education, and I always tell them it's um, uh, it's not not ro uh, rocket science. It's more difficult. So there are other options to follow. And uh, answers come in. Diminish inequalities now. Really true. Important. And are we good at that at Delft? Do you think? Probably we should do better and therefore we need you to help us because you have the background and the ambition. Making life of people easier and more safe. Future proofing society, robotics. Yes, I love robotics. And um, creativity and innovation. So you already see words popping up which are important for making your choice. Do you want to become better at creativity or cooperation, societal skills, mathematics? What do you need for robotics? Well, probably I have uh, some answers for you coming up now because I think it's time to uh, invite our first guest. And uh, my first guest is from Digital Society, Srimanarayana Bharatam. Welcome. So glad that you allow me to say Sriman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that will make the yeah. life easy. Yeah. Come, come closer to me, yeah. Sriman. You are graduated in the Master Robotics. Yes. Wonderful. Thanks. And I see one of the students actually mentioned robotics. So yeah. I guess that student yeah, would be interested. Yeah, yeah. So what do you do now? So I graduated in um, the month of June. And currently I work as a research assistant part time at the Intelligent Vehicles Group, the UDEV. Mm -hmm. And I also have a spin off uh, which uh, works in the field of uh, self driving vehicles based mm -hmm. in Delft. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. Yeah. Uh, why did you choose Delft? Why did you choose this this program? Robotics. So um, mechatronics robotics was has always been a um, fascinating uh, area or topic for me. Unlike maybe decades ago where each unique stream of science could really contribute towards solution, more and more modern solutions uh, take contributions from different domains, integrate into a single solution to make it really smart and effective. So it's like an amalgamation of different areas. So that's what made me curious yeah. and why Delft. To be frank, I applied for a few universities. I got into a few and uh, I felt uh, my friends have studied here at TU Delft before, so I got pretty nice feedback from them. So um, okay. yeah, I felt TU Delft yeah. is where I should uh, pursue my robotics and from. Did yeah. your dreams come true? <laughs> I'm making this choice. Yes, I mean, um, well, uh, you wouldn't know what exactly you would do two years down the line or once you graduate. I have first have to take a leap of faith towards uh, what you wanted to pursue then you would see a lot of doors and opportunities open up yeah you have to be agile from that aspect and i did that and i'm uh, happy the situ with the place i am in right now with uh, both pursuing research and also uh, commercializing the research with my startup so yeah what was your thesis about so my thesis was about uh, detecting vulnerable road users like cyclists and pedestrians in urban environment like Delft, for example, mm -hmm. uh, using uh, next generation sensors fitted on a vehicle so that you make vehicles intelligent to be able to detect the road users and uh, hopefully they also lead towards a reality where you see self-driving cars. Yeah. So that was simply my uh, area of thesis research. Yes. And did you know that when you started the master program? Or no, no. Would go that direction. Uh, no, I had. I was not concretely. Uh, it was not etched in uh, concrete that I would do this, but it was one of the possible ideas that I knew that I might pursue. Yeah. But I also had other uh, thoughts in mind as well uh, yeah. to yeah. look into. But as I said, uh, once you take a leap of faith, you uh, know more, and the more opportunities you are presented with, then you have to pick yeah. what uh, makes or what fits your plan in the future. So that's where I made the choice to pursue with intelligent vehicles. And um, 
what happened in the this is a two year program yes so you start with perhaps with, uh, with courses to take and, yeah um, did they enable you to to be successful in the end yes um my bachelor's background was mechanical and um, i had little to no introduction towards uh, computer science as such. I mean, yeah. I would know the basics, but yeah. uh, not really a strong affinity towards, uh, say, coding, uh, programming languages or open source uh, Linux systems or anything. But one would assume that if you're taking a robotics master's and um, you would need to have all of this information with you before you even uh, take the decision, right? Yeah. Else you would be taking too much. Uh, the faith is uh, yeah. too, I mean, uh, too little to make that step. Yeah. But uh, what I would like to say here is the first year of masters in robotics here at least the way the course is offered in TU Delft is you are equipped with the tools necessary to so, pick the topic yeah. that you are passionate about and perform research so the first year as you rightly said the courses would equip you with those tools you need to be committed and passionate yeah and you would be there so you don't need to worry that oh, i don't I don't have prior knowledge about this and this, but Commitment, yeah. passion, yes. but also a certain background. Your background is mechanical, mechanical engineering. engineering. Yes. So you're not an electrical engineer, not a computer scientist. Yeah. But of course, they are in robotics too, I guess. Um, yes, I mean, uh, computer science students can do, but primarily there was a uh, reservation about what kind of students or students, students with what kind of backgrounds can uh, pursue the program. Yeah. But uh, I'm not right now sure, like, what's the criteria? But what I'm saying is those who are passionate to apply, they need not take a step back because they don't, uh, you know, know certain thing in confidence, but they can really work towards it and make it happen. So that's important for you uh, when you uh, think this program may be something for me, but I have a background in uh, robot in uh, computer science, or is it uh, something for me that is something to ask yeah. this week? Yeah. And um, uh, what are the margins? Uh, my background uh, was a long time ago was chemistry. <laughs> yeah. Could I become successful in robotics? Yeah, that's a bit far-fetched. Uh, if you can be from a mechanical background, you can be from aerospace background, maybe um, I haven't seen computer science students, but I hope they, because there's significant overlap between robotics and computer science, so that's there. I have a friend who was came from electrical uh, engineering background, yeah. so there's yeah. quite some spread yeah, over some which. Spreads, yes, not, yeah. everything's yes not everything's possible. Yes, not everything's possible. Yes, yeah, yeah. But you now are uh, uh, having a startup. Yes. Uh, successful already, or? Yeah, uh, things are looking bright and uh, yeah. uh, kicking yeah. up. So I would yeah. say, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what did you need to learn for that? Or was you already were you already in, in a good entrepreneurial uh, skill uh, person? Um, it's two things. One is I've worked for four years before coming here yeah. in the Indian automotive industry, and I saw on ground like what happens. So I had a bit of a commercial uh, in idea or perspective towards uh, vehicles and how the trend is. Yeah. And here when I began to work into the in, in the intelligent vehicles uh, research, then I saw what's the state of the art that's happening and how that can be commercialized is something uh, that I wanted to pursue. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I gained certain skills regarding uh, communication, entrepreneurial skills during my bachelor's as well. Yeah. But Netherlands uh, has really good opportunities for students who want to pursue entrepreneurial uh, career. Mm. They really encourage uh, to valorize or commercialize whatever research you conduct at universities. In fact, today I went to the NVO uh, grant interview, so that explains my entire bit. Yeah. 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 And how did that work? Uh, are there options for you as a student of this master program to choose? Yes, yes, you have like electives uh, on uh, commercializing ideas. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very, yeah. very true. You have electives in the third and fourth quarters. I guess even in the first quarters, uh, if you are in the second year if you want to pursue, but you have uh, programs, entrepreneurial programs, which span over a couple of semesters or a couple of quarters, um, which would uh, which which would help impart uh, the knowledge to you, which will enable you to pursue if you are interested and if you want to try out. So, and you also have a nice uh, ecosystem here in the Delft. Also, TU Delft enables you. We have Delft, uh, Delft Innovation and Impact Center. Everything you have, everything to be an entrepreneur you will here. Encounter that in in these master programs. 
Yes, uh, the opportunity. Yes, I will also sure. point to the second word. This yeah. is all digital. Robotics is digital. Yes. It's kind of yeah. engineering. It's programming, but it's also about society. Yes. What is so societal about robotics? Uh, I can explain from the uh, efforts I'm pursuing why this, how I can relate to a societal contribution towards yeah. my startup or towards the research I chose to do during my thesis. So one of the uh, elements uh, students actually uh, mentioned earlier was equality or stop reduce inequality if yeah. we are not wrong. So I saw that uh, for self-driving cars, the technology, everything is was focused towards mobility and um, robot axes, yeah. but that's towards comfort and independence, but even more fundamental is safety on roads. That's fundamental and that's where we need to move up. And in developing countries, you still can make vehicles intelligent even without even before taking the driver out of the seat right uh, using advanced driver assistance systems and for yeah. that to happen you need to make the technology available at an affordable price yes. so that's where my company uh, puts efforts towards so make the uh, technology more affordable thereby making safety a right for everyone and it should not be a privilege on roads so that was my uh, value uh, driven motto yeah. for my company and are you stimulated by the program uh, still related Stim Stim stimulated to follow this this ambition yes of course uh, in my third quarter i actually uh, approached one of the course coordinators with the idea and i was introduced to my P one of the phds and who happened to be eventually my uh, thesis supervisor so take your ideas to, uh, to the coordinators explain have an open discussion and they'll lead you guide you to the right people and yeah, yeah. so it it's was going inside in the laboratory develop robotics and then go out Meet people, yes. live in the city, and contribute. Perfect. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I you think, so much. Uh, I will uh, wish you uh, lots of success with your uh, startup and yeah. with your career. Yeah. And I guess uh, we will learn more about this person yeah. in our society. Thank See you. Jan. Thank you. And then um, um, I think we have um, a Mentimeter question again. Well, this is um, important, of course, um, when you are unblocking it. What is most important to you in your choice for a master's program? There it is. I'm looking at self-confidence, something inside yourself. The city, social life, that's outside yourself. It is interdisciplinarity, I would read. So, it was a good example of electrical engineering, computer science, but my contribution like chemistry is not yet there. So these are possibilities, but there are also constraints. Not everything goes. Uh, sustainability pops up as a very important uh, thing, and I hope we are in Delft are good at that. And um, I think I will welcome the um, uh, next uh, guest in this kickoff event. And the guest is Martijn Machtegaal. Hi. Martijn, welcome. Yeah. We are here. Nice to be here. And uh, the question is, of course, who is Martijn Achtergaal? And what is he doing in his yeah. life? I'm a PhD candidate uh, here at the TU Delft and also partly at the LUMC, the Leiden University Medical Center. And um, I'm doing, doing my PhD within the Faculty of Applied Sciences and I'm working there on MRI research and how we can um, uh, perform quantitative measurements uh, when someone is lying in an MRI and how we can make these scans faster. And that's uh, quite a nice field to work in. Yeah, you, you like it. Yeah, for sure. Is, is that the reason why you're doing this? Uh, I think there are uh, several reasons, uh, but yeah, important reasons I like it. Uh, yeah. You're doing this every day and yeah. then um, of course it's not every day as much fun as you would want it to be, but uh, I think there are interesting questions to work on um yeah so i like that uh, and how yeah. does it interact with these theme health and care because i can imagine that in your daily life you don't discuss societal needs every day uh, probably you see patients maybe not uh i don't see patients uh, personally 
Um, but I do think that uh, by training, I'm a mathematician and physicist. Um, and there are many applications where you could be working in the lab, uh, trying to tune your laser, how you can measure certain properties of some material, uh, which is great fun and some friends yeah. of mine have been doing. Yeah. Um, but in the research that I'm doing, I really like the idea that at some point, uh, these techniques that we develop, uh, try to make it possible that someone is lying in the scanner uh, for 10 minutes instead of an hour, yeah. or that we can see certain disease development uh, earlier on than you could see with previously used methods. And I think we need quite fundamental knowledge for that. Uh, and those are the things that we work on within applied sciences uh, that can then be applied later on uh, in the clinic. Um, so, for example, this afternoon, I'm currently doing a study in which we, a method that we've been developing, we are applying that uh, on a patient data set. And this afternoon, I was discussing this with one of my promoters, who's a radiologist, and how this, what we think that we're seeing, is this really what we expect to see in MS patients? Uh, how does that work? And that's really nice. Uh, I think that works towards a contribution to health and society yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, well, I hear no, no uh, contradiction between fundamental research, what you are doing, and the impact on society. We no, need, uh, we need it. Yeah, I do think we need both. Yeah, yeah. but it's also it's also important to bring that together, of course, yeah. and that's sometimes a bit of a puzzle. Yeah, uh, I try to do that by having a nice supervisory team uh, where both uh, 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 applied physicists uh, are in there, but also radiologists. Uh, so I'm more from the image processing side. Have all these people on the, uh, on the table is really uh, beneficial. Yeah. And what was your way towards this position? Um, what did you study and why? And was that a good choice that you make? Yeah, so I studied applied physics and applied mathematics as a bachelor. Uh, that was a combined bachelor degree, uh, which was a nice opportunity to see a bit of both sides. Mm -hmm. And then I decided to do a board here in the study association of applied physics. And then you would think, oh, that makes perfect sense to continue in physics. But I realized that uh, doing MRI, uh, doing mathematics might be nice as well uh, and has a broader way of applying it. Um, I'll come back to these nice yeah. MRI scans later. Give me a second. Yeah. Um, and then, so I decided to do my best to my master's in applied mathematics in the end. Um, but then I want to go to the physics part again and got involved with Philips in doing my master project, uh, partly uh, with Philips in Hamburg, uh, which was really nice. Uh, and then we worked there. We worked on the project that I'm working on now as well. Um, after that, I got into contact with my supervisor in Delft now, and he uh, proposed that I could do this uh, this PhD project with him. So you did uh, applied mathematics as a master. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, think about other options to pursue your career? Uh, well, what, so what can you do with applied mathematics? Um, so with applied mathematics, well, for me it was quite clear that I want to stay in research. Yeah. Uh, I like the environment there and the challenges that you get, and also the application that you have in physics. Um, so, but I also thought about uh, seeing whether it would be nice to do something in governmental positions or uh, consultancy perhaps. But for me, it was quite clear I want to go to the research part there. Yeah. And now you are in the um, Faculty of Applied Sciences yeah. as yeah. a mathematician, more or less. Ba oh, yeah, back in the physics. Uh, Working on again. health and care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who would expect that from applied uh, 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 science? Yeah, well, I think there's a lot to be applied. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what we do there. Yeah, yeah. so also in health and science. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Are there other uh, ways towards your position apart from um, uh, mathematics? Uh, so for f with physics, you could get there yeah. as well for sure. Um, there are also quite some people who did have a background in electrical engineering. Uh, there's also a lot of signal processing uh, which comes into play. Um, some colleagues have more an uh, aerospace engineering background. Uh, I think if you're solid in, in a bit of a mathematics part, physics part, you have those feelings, um, you'll get there, especially if you're interested in what you're doing. Yeah. Um, may, you may need a few more months of getting used to it, but uh, PT is four years, so that will be. So there's uh, some interdisciplinarity in your work. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I think so. Yeah. Well, Shall I say something about this? Yeah, yeah so it's colorful. It looks like. Yeah, Green you see something, maybe you see something in here that this represents kind of like a head, yeah. you know, the outer yeah. part of the skull. Yeah. Um, so what we what I work on is quantitative MRI and we try to measure different properties of the brain. But then what we um, conventionally do is take 10 different measurements of the brain, yeah. try to have 10 perfect pictures with different settings and then try to fit uh, different 
tissue properties to those images. But an MRI scan is not as fast. Maybe you heard people complaining about that. Maybe yeah. you've been into one. Lying still. Uh, yeah, you need to yeah. lie still. And if that scan takes 20, 30 minutes, the chances are high that you will move. Yeah. Um, it takes a long time, costs money, all these reasons why you won't, don't want to do it like that. Uh, at the same time, you know that all these images will look the same every time it's a brain in there. And now what we drew, do is we take a lot of we take many images, as you see here, all these uh, small uh, brains that you see here or something underneath um, is an image with slightly different settings. And in the end, we can still perform this fit uh, and make sure that's robust enough to in the end obtain nice quantitative maps of the brain. And here we see uh, the T1 and it, the transversal and the longitudinal relaxation times uh, that represent different uh, brain properties. And it helps us to identify certain uh, disease development. Yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to the moment that you can see um, uh, learning processes in uh, MRI scans. Uh, yeah, yeah. Will that That's, ever happen? Um, I'm not so sure about that. I think the brain is really complex. Yeah. Um, and with an MRI, perhaps we can go to a resolution of um, less than one millimeter. Uh, a quarter of uh, a quarter of a millimeter, perhaps, but the brain is way more complex than that. Uh, as I was just writing down in a proposition in my propositions of my thesis, if you want to read someone's uh, thoughts, then you should read a book that he or she has been written, writing. Um, really, yeah, more to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's still some development to yeah. make there. On the other side of the camera, maybe your future master students uh, are looking at you. Yeah. Uh, do you need master students for your for your PhD, and what kind of role can they play? Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't necessarily think that you need master students, but I did enjoy it a lot to supervise master students uh, because it creates a different atmosphere. You're certainly uh, working in a team. Uh, I was supervising two master students for a year, yeah. and it was actually great fun because. I was trying to explain them what I was doing and together we were learning uh, what their project was about. Uh, for me, it was a reason to also dive into to make sure that I was looking into that project yeah. that they were working on, try to understand as well. Um, and I tried to have daily meetings with them and uh, get as far as we could within those projects. Um, maybe I didn't do as much research as research by myself that year, uh, but I was doing research together with them and it was actually more fun uh, and really nice for a change. In the end, we also wrote uh, papers about both of their projects and one of them is working at Philips and the other one started mm -hmm. doing a PhD project yeah. as well. So yeah, it was a really nice yeah. interaction there. So that's something to consider. Do you like collaboration? Do you like interdisciplinarity, teamwork? Uh, maybe you're in a solo uh, type, uh, so it's important to know yourself, who you are, what you are, and ask your questions to um, to people like uh, Martijn uh, uh, in the during uh, the master uh, uh, event. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, uh, I'm wonderful, and uh, right. I hope uh, uh, when I am old and need treatment in an MRI scan that you already had, had the breakthrough. Uh, yeah, quick scan, see everything and yeah. then know what's going on. That's the goal. Yeah, yeah. societal yeah. impact. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. OK, great. And uh, we go on with, uh, I think, uh, the next um, uh, Mentimeter events. Are we on screen? What is important? Things are sustainability still there, but I see flexibility in capital letters, um, but also world and I feel. Uh, so there is the, the, the interaction with who am I and what is the world like? I see independence. Uh, that is uh, something different from teamwork. So uh, difficulty is some of you are looking for uh, challenges and uh, that's I uh, suppose we have lots of master programs who are challenging you. They may not be all easy. So that is um, uh, up to you to find out what is uh, stimulating you, challenging you, but also helping you to grow and become better. Um, probably we are already there for uh, our next um, guest. And, um, the next guest is a real student and she is Nikki de Zeel and from um, uh, architecture, I think. Nikki, tell us something about you. 
Yeah. Why you? Why are you doing? Like you just said, I'm uh, currently a master student in architecture. Uh, at the two Delft, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, for the past couple of years, I've also been a part of uh, Team Sum, which is one of the dream teams uh, that the TU Delft uh, hosts. What is a dream team? So a dream team is uh, basically uh, a team that works on a very specific uh, goal. Uh, other examples of dream teams are, for example, solar boat, solar car. Um, so you work with a bigger team yeah. towards a goal. Very often that um, includes a competition of some sorts to test the actual thing that you're working on. Um, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and your dream team is SUM? Yes, my dream team is, uh, is SUM. And what does SUM stand for? SUM stands for the Symbiotic Urban Movement. Yeah. And uh, we are actually the third team that uh, focuses on the topic of, uh, of uh, resilient cities and mobility uh, at the TU Delft. Before us, we had uh, pret a and more. And what we focus on mainly is, um, is actually two things. Uh, so you can see it on the yeah. screen right now here. I'm sorry, it's in Dutch, but um, there's two really big issues that the Dutch built environment is currently facing. Uh, and that's that we want to build an additional 1 million homes by 2030. And we also want all of our building stock to be completely energy neutral by 2050 and everything's just going too slow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so um, together with my team that you can see over here, we actually competed before summer. Um, huge team, this is only a part of it. I think over the course of three years, uh, about 120 students from tons of different nationalities, tons of different uh, study directions worked on it. and. Um, what we did is we created a plan to renovate and extend um, tenement flats. And this is a structure that's very common yeah. in the Netherlands, especially yeah. in the bigger cities. Um, but they, the similar structure can actually be found everywhere in the world. Um, and what they are, they're all post-war. So uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they were all built. Uh, very, very good, uh, heavy structures but they're all a bit dilapidated by now. There's not been a lot of sustaining and a lot of them now in the Netherlands at least are on the demolishing list. And because we as students at some point wanna own our own home, <laughs> we said it's a bit ridiculous for you guys to demolish 847,000 homes um, to build new ones. Yeah. When we could also just adapt the existing structure. And that's what you can see here actually. On the left, you have the original structures and on the right, you have what we make of it. It, it sounds indeed a little bit silly to do that, but um, what is the alternative? Are your plans better? And how do you know that? <laughs> yes, so um, over the last couple of years, we've uh, not only designed the entire project, but we also built a prototype, which we uh, which we took uh, to Wuppertal, where the competition was. And what we basically did is we are introducing the build environment to factory build because that's something that's now very hard. A lot of builders believe that every single thing desires a very specific solution, where we believe that especially in these cases where, uh, for example, entire neighborhoods were done with one set of drawings, 40 buildings were built in the exact same way, you can actually do a lot of modifications and fabricate it. And what we did is we basically built uh, catalog model which which you can do the entire structure so you have the original structure we are adapting the ground floor to make everything more yeah. livable we are adding a core with an elevator we're adding a gallery so that people can actually use it even in your old age for example uh, we are adding more living spaces on top so we are just putting them right on top and then um, that's where the symbiosis comes in what we do is we actually uh, also put solar panels on the roof and on the facade of the newly built structure, which will provide for enough energy for both the newly built and the uh, original structure as well. Mm -hmm. You easily say that you add something uh, to, but this is a very conceptual drawing. Yes. Uh, is, there no, is there money involved in, in such an uh, in analysis? Well, it's um, for us, it was very interesting because at the beginning there wasn't because we were just students. We were trying yeah. to to compete. We were trying to think of the next best solution. And that's where the competition that we participated in, which is the Solar Decathlon Europe, 
was so interesting because it made us go from theory into practice. And that's the image that you see here. We took our building design. Yeah. We took the parts that were most important to us. So the new structures, the the core and then the ground floor, which had yeah. a lot of social functions. We mashed them all together and that made our prototype. And that's real. And that's real. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So um yeah, we built that uh over well I I shouldn't say over the summer. We built this entire structure in 14 days. Because that was another thing that was demanded of us by the competition. Uh, this is another time, yeah. a short, uh, smaller part of my team. And then over the course of 14 days, um, we built this entire structure with mainly students. Wow. Yeah. And how? Um, uh, what was your career before you were in the SEM team? You are student of architecture. Was yes. Was it also your bachelor? I did also my bachelor's here in Delft. Yeah. Um, but I've also always been interested in kind of more of a broader specter than just specifically architecture, because yeah. that's what you notice very often is that a lot of architects, they're very much about the design and very specifically go into that. I myself am also really interested in the techniques, and I think a lot of students in Delft are that way, but I'm also very interested in more of the social aspects. So that's why I decided to join this team to yeah. develop myself in multiple ways. Yeah. Question I also uh, wanted to ask to an architect. Uh, are oh, you no. creative and what does that mean and how do you become a creative person? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a different one to, to answer because um, for me, creativity can come from a lot of different things. So um, my mom always used to say that she wasn't a creative person uh, and that I was. Uh, and she always used to say that my sister wasn't a creative person, but then I couldn't do the things that they do. So it's creativity is is a spectrum. Yeah. For me, I'm very good with buildings and I like to draw by hand and that's where my creativity comes from. But it's also, especially that one is a creativity that you can kind of learn because you can be trained in it. I mean, if you draw often enough, you won't become the next Picasso, but <laughs> okay, you'll become better. You'll become better and you'll be. Yeah. So it's um, very interesting because I think especially the way of thinking that you need in architecture is something that the TU Delft and its master's program focuses very heavily on. So they very much teach you to think in concepts and how you take those concepts into uh, a working building, so to say. Yeah, and, and how do they teach that? We're uh, still in the, middle, in the middle of the process, I think. Mm -hmm. So what do you learn from your teachers? Well, that's also very interesting <laughs> because in architecture, I think it's a bit different than in all other master's courses. Architecture is one of the tracks that you can choose. Yeah. But then also within architecture, you have different studios that you can choose. So you can kind of pick and mix whatever you would want. So for example, if you don't have a lot of experience in engineering, detailing, you can choose architectural engineering. If you want more into the research and the philosophy side of it, you can do borders and territory, territories, which is the studio yeah. that I'm currently yeah. graduating in. So it's... So you find your way by thinking, I like this and I try it out. Yes, and then you find I have no idea what this is about and yeah. I might try this. So yeah. that's also, there's a lot of room for... Uh, yeah. for trying new things. What's next? For me, currently with uh, people that kind of uh, have been left over from the SEM team, we were looking into uh, putting our work into practice. So now we have a concept. Um, in this concept, we have the modules that we build ourselves. We have the facades that we build ourselves. Yeah. We have everything here. So now we're trying to scale that up. And for me, after that, I'm going to be going into the workforce, hopefully, and uh, trying to get my degree in art or my uh, title as an architect. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you think of the theme of the Theo Delft? Resilient cities and mobility. But you're not talking about mobility. No, but that's more because for me as an architect, my. My focus is buildings. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds yeah. very dumb, but I think in the in the design process, it's also very important to realize that everybody has their specialties. So as an architect, I like to think about the buildings. I also like to think about what it does for the neighborhood. But I do have to say that my strong suit isn't designing the way people move around the neighborhood. That's what you have your urbanists, your civil engineers yeah. for. Yeah. Um, and especially because uh, buildings are often on such a large scale, it's very important to look at that. 
And as for the theme of resilient, uh, resilient cities, I have to say that that for me is the most important thing, because if we're just looking at the buildings alone and trying to renovate them and trying to get them energy neutral, it doesn't make sense because we'll still be dealing with the with the yeah. urban heat island effect. We'll still be dealing with a lot of other issues. So it becomes important to look at the city as a whole instead of just the individual pieces. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And you want to become an architect. Yes. Yeah. As of now, yes, yeah. but then also with my master's that I'm doing now with my bachelor's degree, I can still do anything. That's that's the beauty of it. I could still yeah. go into management if I like. I can I can go into advisory roles. So that's also very important with this master's degree. You're still very open to any direction, basically. And how is the rest of your life? Because this is all very conceptual, intellectual, academic and mm -hmm. Do you have time for play volleyball or <laughs> drink beer or? Yes, yeah, yeah of, of course. Like I'm very, for the rest of it, it seems like I'm a very conceptual person, but I'm actually very pragmatic. I, I work at the student IT desk at Architecture two days a week. I yeah. love doing ceramics at, yeah. at X at the TU Delft, um, where they offer a lot of cultural team courses. I work out, so it's like, so it all depends on how you there is a real life for you. There is a real yeah. life. And for you, perhaps. <laughs> there is a real life. Yeah. It's not all yeah. studying. It's just you have to be mindful of yourself and also of your tutors. Just be honest with your tutors. Most most tutors that I've spoken to in the Netherlands, if you tell them honestly what you need, yeah, they will listen to you. So this is an advice to the future master students. Yes. Be honest, ask questions, yes, and find sure. out who you are. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good luck with the career. Thank you so much. Yes. And we have another Mentimeter question coming up, I think. And this is still what is uh, important to you, but now we are asking you what you will do this week. There are, I counted them, I think 45 options for you to choose from. Maybe you can uh, do more, but you cannot do them all. So probably you already made up your mind a little bit and we will see what happens um, when the answers come up. Uh, well, architecture is <laughs> the biggest one. Well, of course, uh, some of our master's program uh, accommodate a lot of students. Others are uh, smaller, so it would be wise to, to find out um, how many students uh, can um, become a master's student in a certain program if you um, want to be sure that you're welcome. And I'm looking already at our uh, fourth guest and uh, our fourth guest is uh, on the theme we haven't yet uh, mentioned, that's climate and energy. And his name is Paul van Wiegen. Paul, welcome. And of course, who is Paul van Wiegen? What is he doing mm -hmm. in daily life? Uh, yeah, so hi, I'm Paul van Wiegen. I'm uh, currently a PhD candidate in civil engineering. Uh, I also did my, my bachelor's and master's in civil engineering as well. And then, well, I enjoyed doing research a lot, so I decided to continue with it. Uh, and I'm currently two years in, so so I'm halfway in my PhD. Um, and uh, yeah, I started in, uh, in 2020. Is civil engineering and research uh, logical combination? Uh, yeah, it is. I, I I actually really enjoy it. So there's a lot of uh, yeah, you're really close to 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 applying sciences. Uh, for, for instance, in in our field of work, I'm in hydraulic engineering. Yeah, you can build key walls, and and that's all stuff you can really fathom and you can see in front of your uh, in front of you happening. But there's also a lot of space for doing real research. And so, how exactly is that wave hitting on a key wall? What are these water particles doing inside one of those waves? And that's really going into real science and real research because yeah. there's yeah. a lot of things we don't know yet. Yeah, so there's interaction between engineering as a uh, design and construction activity and thinking about uh, causes and effects and explaining them. Yeah. So what does your uh, daily life look like? Are you behind a computer screen and writing articles or? Um, so uh, I'm actually doing a PhD, which is really uh, about going out in the field. Okay. So uh, you were doing a lot of experiments and, and one of the main goals was actually to do these experiments in real life and, and really on the beach. So um, a lot of experiments are being done in a laboratory because then you can control everything, but then you always 
you're not completely certain of the things you're actually replicating if they also happen in real life. And that's why for this project, we decided to do a lot of field work is what we call it. So uh, a year ago, we, we started this big campaign during uh, the winter season, because in the winter we have a lot of storms and we wanted to see what storms do uh, on our beaches and also on our dune systems. So what so we that's did in uh, the Netherlands. That's in the Netherlands, yeah, yeah. So what we did is we uh, we constructed two two dunes on the beach, okay. just above the high water line, because well we want we wanted the storm to come in and really hit these dunes. So we had to sort of bring the dunes to the sea, because well then you increase your odds of actually having uh, having some impact. And then yeah, so we built those in in uh, in October, and then in November and December we stayed at the holiday park just around the beach waiting for a storm to come and then a storm came and then we all went to the beach yes and, uh, and did our yeah. research so how do you there. build a dune i tried that as a kid uh, build sand castles <laughs> really work <laughs> yeah so so yeah i also built a lot of cast uh, sand castles when i was small but the yeah if, if i'd had a bulldozer then i think i would be able to build a big dune but we had we had bulldozers and dumpers and everything and we designed a real uh, yeah a real dune it, it was 150 meters long and it was uh, five and a half meters high, so it, it's it's a really big thing there. Yeah, we didn't mention the theme climate and energy, but obviously this could have some impact on climate, I guess. Uh, so Your research. Uh, but what I really notice is um, we really want to predict. So by law, the Dutch government has to be uh, has to make sure that our dunes can withstand this, this sort of superstorm, which is a storm with waves of eight meters. Uh, and what we also see is that due to climate change, for instance, this this wave climate can actually change. Yeah. Uh, we, for instance, uh, a clear example is, is sea level rise. Uh, if, if the water goes up, well, the waves that come in also, yeah, remain larger when they when they approach the coast. They reach on these they reach these dunes faster. So those are all aspects which are currently changing. And we really want to identify, OK, what happens if the wave height, for instance, becomes 20% larger? Or what happens if our water level raises with half a meter? What yeah. is the, the change of that? And what what does hap what does happen with our dune system when something like that happens? So that's that's where the climate part comes in in this research. But uh, you're still smiling, so I guess we're not at risk at the moment or? Uh, well, well, there's actually two sides to the story. Yeah? So so on one hand, we by actually being able to predict the impact of storms. We can ensure our safety, which is really the primary objective here, but we can also identify regions where our safety is already in place, where we're more than safe. Yeah. And in those areas, you can actually just yeah let nature run its course and really return to these natural dune systems instead of these these typical sort of sand walls we have at some uh, stretches along the coast. So so it, it goes both ways, and I think uh, we're more than safe uh, as as we currently are. Huh? We we meet all the standards we have to, and we do a lot of research yearly to really make sure that we keep uh, these standards in place. Uh, but by being able to predict more, we can also predict areas where we can let nature run its course, which I think is a nice aspect as well. Yeah, uh, this is all about um, uh, climate change, is about ethics, about how we live, uh, how we should live. Uh, were you, are you prepared for that, for to taking that into your research, these kind of decisions? Uh, to what do what do you, what does happen to you when you are a master student at civil engineering uh, to prepare you for these societal threats and the role of technology in it? Um, that's a, that's a good question. I'm thinking of, uh, on when I did my masters uh, back in the days. So I think because uh, so for instance for this this example we're currently in you know, with all this, this dune erosion. I think by actually going out in the field and by seeing what these waves do to our systems, you also get to think of really the impact something like sea level rise or anything could have. Could have. And with knowing what that impact would be, you can also well yeah. understand that that sometimes you have to do things differently to make sure that sort of the impact lowers again a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I think for instance, so this is a photo we took uh, during one of the, the storms we had. And on the right, you have the, the dune we built and here are some equipment. And actually, well, uh, if you feel the impact of these waves, then then you notice like, okay, this is this is this serious. is big stuff. This is yeah. serious stuff. And then we actually know that. And then, well, you get to think about things like, okay, if this actually still intensifies, then we're really, yeah, we're uh, we're in trouble. So maybe we should behave in a way that we reduce the risks of actually increasing our sea level and then our wave impact. Are you supervising master students? Yeah, yeah, and uh, so so. Uh, I'm 
supervising master, I'm currently supervising two master students. I supervised also some others which are already finished again. Um, and and well, they get to be involved in projects like this or, or in, in in modeling research now, yeah, where you actually start doing model predictions of of, yeah. of impact. Uh, and there's really a ton of ton of assignments you can do, and it's also really fun because you get to work with people. And what are you looking for in in students? Uh, you mentioned modeling uh, skills. That's obviously something with mathematics and and physical knowledge. But other qualities. Uh, yeah, so, so on one hand you have modeling, which is really into computers and and, and, and everything. On the other hand, we're also doing field work. Field work. Uh, we did a, a campaign a couple of months ago on the beach again, uh, and there's also the possibility of a master student to really be involved in field work and really on the practical side of things, yeah. and really do your data analysis. So there's like a ton of things. There's also possibility to do uh, do your graduation at a company and really start into into designing. Uh, measures against flooding, so designing key walls. It's also a possibility. So there's yes. there's a yeah. ton of work there. Yeah. Uh, when you look back at your own road towards this position, were you well prepared? Did you make the right choices every time in your life? What was especially valuable for you when you were a master student? Um, what I what I really liked about uh, the master program we had and still have is is that there's. And there's a possibility to do a lot of different courses on one hand. There's also the possibility to do intern internships at a company. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility to do an additional thesis, for instance. And uh, well, I, for instance, did an internship at a company and then I decided, OK, I'm, for my graduation, I'm going to do full research. I'm just going to stay at TU Delft and then see how, what, what research is like. And that, all those different aspects really helped me make a choice. Uh, and in the end, well, I enjoyed doing research the most. So I thought, OK, well, I'm going to continue doing research and it might very well be that in two years time I think okay, I want to do something different again and yeah. You never know your future of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really. So you think you made the right choices in the end? Were you so sure when you were halfway? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually really happy with uh, with the choices I make. It's always really you know, scary in the beginning but in the end well you can also change quite easily. So, yeah. so in so, sense, you're not really fixed. No, it's once important you make to make the best possible choice, of course, yeah. but then you say, well, OK, it's not fixed. Your life is not fixed. There are many ways towards uh, becoming an expert. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you are a researcher. And did you know that, uh, let's say, uh, 10 years ago already, that that would be your passion? No, no, I uh, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> It was so, really during the master, uh, yeah, really also during the graduation program. Yeah, we all up for graduated. some surprises then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, um, what advice can you give uh, future master students? Not uh, just civil engineering, of course, but TU wide. It's um, important to become happy and successful. Well, I think what we just mentioned, so realize that you're not, uh, so you're making the decision to choose a master program, but you're not really fixed uh, afterwards. And eh? you can still cha change. You yeah. can also work at different companies. You can do research. There's a ton of possibilities still in the open. So be open minded in that sense. Open mindedness. OK. Thank you, Paul. All right. Good luck with the PhD and with the climate <laughs> and the dunes. <laughs> and I hope it is not necessary for build higher and higher and higher. Thank you. Thank you. That was Paul. That were our guests for tonight. And uh, we are up to the closing of this session with um, a few uh, Mentimeter reflections. Which master programs are you going to visit this week? And um, uh, I see urbanism, robotics, computer science. So many of you already looked well at the TU Delft.nl kickoff site to make your choice. I see product design, civil engineering. Do I see science education and communication, for example, uh, which is also an option? Uh, maybe uh, those students, uh, we have to work harder. Same for some other colleagues. Um, there are so many choices, so many options and so many roads towards a bright and wonderful future. Um, OK, so uh, check out the websites, um, find out what the programs are when you want to visit uh, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, we are all there to uh, to inform you, to make you enthusiastic about uh, uh, our 
uh, our own program, but also we are not in a competition with each other. Uh, we as uh, science education, we want to have this all into our teacher training programs. We want teachers to be able to teach about climate change, about digital society, about resilient cities and mobility, and about health and care. Um, when I started working for the TU Delft, I was unaware that so many of our research projects actually are, have something to do with health. Uh, uh, especially as uh, Martijn et al is in uh, applied sciences uh, with physical imaging, a lot of things are going on that have impact on society. So you can make uh, uh, impact too uh, in, uh, when you make the, the best possible choice and then no pressure intended. This is life changing of course, and still, um, we all see in our lives that um, uh, you can always uh, start another day. So uh, we hope uh, to see you tomorrow, um, uh, Wednesday, Thursday in the, the master events and in our desks. And uh, we uh, would love to uh, see you again uh, after the next summer uh, when the master programs uh, all start, that you enroll as a master student at the Technical University of Delft. And now we are drawing to an end. I think um, we have um, uh, said what we want you to uh, to hear. Um, we are looking towards the future as you are, and we are welcoming you very much. Good night.